Hello and welcome everyone, I'm Exceptional and I hope you are too. Welcome to Stardew Valley. In this game, you've inherited your grandfather's old farm plot in Stardew Valley. Armed with hand-me-down tools and a few coins, you set out to begin your new life. This game rocked my world when it first released and I've played through it several times over the years. Recently, there was an absolutely titanic update, adding a huge amount of additional content. In this playthrough, my goal is to reach perfection, or 100% completion. Given that this is a new game for my channel, I will be taking time to follow along with the story, character relationships, and myriad of little things that all add up to this incredible game experience. There's farming, mining, combat, fishing, foraging, building relationships with the townsfolk. You start with essentially nothing and grow yourself into an empire that pretty much controls the economy of this small town. You can expand and grow to the point where you completely run out of map space. This game is massive, but the only real pressure that exists in it is what you put on yourself. I tend to play this game a little more intensely than some because you can play this game in whatever style you choose. I'm hoping that through my chaos I can show you a few tips and tricks to improve your gameplay or encourage you to try this game for yourself. I will be playing completely mod-free, experiencing this amazing game as intended by the developer Concerned Ape. So without any further ado, let's jump right in to our Stardew adventure. We start off like so many other games, spending about three hours in the character creation. I'm just kidding, I'm not gonna force you through all of that, but I'm pretty much making the character to look like me, I guess? My name is gonna be Egghead, our farm is gonna be the Exceptional Farm, of course, I guess my favorite thing is redundancy? No, that's a little weird, I'll show you what this field changes later, but I'll just go with eggs. I'm already experiencing new things in this as I select my white kitty cat, oh yeah. Back in my day, there was only the orange cat, see? There are a couple of additional options, like changing how the economy works, how the community center is laid out, but for this playthrough, I'm gonna be leaving it all entirely default. And of course, it just so happens that in this update came the Meadowlands Farm. As you can see on the right, there are eight separate styles of farm, each with their own advantages and disadvantages. On the Meadowlands Farm, you have less space to farm overall, but you start with a coop and two chickens. Is it a shock to anybody that this guy's gonna be going for an egg empire? As I mentioned throughout this playthrough, we will be focusing on story elements, and the first cutscene leads us into the game. I won't be covering it in super deep detail because I do encourage you to try this game for yourself. Grandpa is looking a little tired, and he's gonna give us a letter. He tells us not to open this letter until the time is right. Fast forward, and here we are working for the evil corporate monsters of this game, Joja. Alright, let's ignore me for a second. What is going on with this cowboy? Whatever he's doing, I'm sure his girlfriend appreciates it. Life isn't going quite as we expected, working for the man, so we decide to finally open up that note that Grandpa gave us. The opening line is, if you're reading this, you must be in dire need of a change. This note includes the deed to the farm down in Stardew Valley. A short bus ride later and we arrive in town being greeted immediately. Robin comes off super friendly, and she is, but she also throws in the occasional, oh, by the way, I can make all of your property better by building things. Throughout this series, I will be attempting to cover all aspects of the game, but I do have to be selective about what I include in each episode. We also meet Lewis, who was just hanging out in our house for some reason, what the heck, dude. But he's friendly enough, and the mayor of the town. In the spring, I won't be focusing on the relationship aspects of the game, instead focusing on getting some profits rolling. Robin and Lewis hand the reins over to us, and we finally take control of our character. At the start of every playthrough, I start by tweaking a couple of the options. There are a couple that make your life a lot easier, like always show tool hit location. It creates a little red outline around the tile that you're about to interact with, so you can actually target what you're doing. Especially in the early game, conservation of energy is so important. I also do a couple of other things like adjusting my UI scale just to make it feel a little bit more comfortable for me. At the very bottom of the options menu is a screenshot option, which we will be touching on very soon. Scrolling through the rest of the tabs in the menu here, you can see just how much is in this game. By the end of this playthrough, I want every single one of these items filled out. As I mentioned on the Meadowlands farm, we start with two chickens that are automatically named Gravy and Potatoes. Oh my goodness, I love this game. Taking a look at the screenshot of our farm, though, it's pretty obvious. We got some work to do. 
Another thing that I do, again, before even leaving our house, is I gotta rearrange a little furniture. This space is like 70 square tiles, and I only need like 15. Like I said, I do play this a little bit more intensely, and when you're rushing to get to bed before you pass out at night, it's kinda nice to have it right next to the door. The TV as well is gonna give us a bunch of nifty information throughout the run, so I put it right next to the bed. Look at that room setup. Teenager me would have been proud. We finally step outside, and the first order of business is to go touch our chickens. Um, actually, that sounds a little weird. I'm probably gonna call it touching them a lot, but that's just because I'm weird. We're just interacting with them in order to improve our relationship. Wait, is that even weirder? Ugh, never mind. We're given a little bit of hay to start to feed our chickens, which we can fill in here, but if you open the door on the front of the coop, they will actually just eat the grass in the overworld. They'll move in and out of the coop as they please, pretty much spending the day outside and then heading indoors when it's time to sleep. You want to be careful about leaving your coop door open overnight though, because your chickens can have some encounters with foxes. I mean, I know how tasty potatoes and gravies are for me. Our little chickens aren't grown up enough to produce eggs yet, but as long as we touch them and feed them, they will be soon enough. There isn't a whole heck of a lot that you can do on the first day. My primary focus is going to be exploring the map, gathering a little bit of forage, and collecting some wood. On the Meadowlands farm, we started with the 15 pieces of hay, but typically you start with parsnip seeds. Since I have nothing to plant into the ground, our first stop is going to be the general store, but first I'm going to go rummage through some garbage cans. Rummaging through garbage cans actually has a chance to yield some incredibly powerful items, but there is a drawback. A, it's super random, and B, if you rummage through a garbage can too close to one of the villagers, they won't really like it and you'll lose a little bit of relationship with them. We'll get more into the relationship mechanics in a future video. Then we can hop into the building pretty much right in the center of the town map. There are two places that you can buy seeds from, Pierre's and the Joja Mart. There are two kind of main progression paths that you can choose in this game. One supports the community center, filling it out with items, which we will touch on in a little bit. And the other is simply feeding money into the Joja Corp. I will not be supporting Joja in this playthrough. The keen-eyed among you will notice that the time has gone backwards? Because it had been so long since I last played, I was shaking the cobwebs off a little bit and decided to restart my day. The progress will only save overnight. This is an important mechanic to know because if you get super messed up during a day, you can reset it. I decided it was more optimal to start clearing out a little bit of that farm space for ourselves before going to the general store. I will not be restarting many days, but hey, it's day one. Let me get my little chicken legs back under me. This time though, I'm gonna take a longer route to get to town. I'm gonna carve a small path through the farm leading south. There are three exits to the farm, north, south, and east. If you ever get confused as to what's leading you where, just hit M and look at the map. I'm sorry, I don't know what the console buttons are. The exit south leads us into a pretty big area that is quite important during the spring season. A trick that you can use is taking a screenshot of this region so that you can see where all of the forage is. During the spring in the southeast portion of the map, it has a very high chance of spawning spring onions. They don't sell for much, but like I said, energy is incredibly important in the early game and you can eat them for energy. As long as you're in a menu in this game, time will pause, but I will note that that is not the case in multiplayer games. I will try my best to cover all of the instances in which time operates differently between single and multiplayer. Really though, the only difference is that in single player, the time is paused more often. I complete the loop buying the same seeds that I bought the first time from Pierre, and now it's time to plant them. In order to plant seeds, you first have to hoe the earth. You'll note that these tiles all have different textures. Only the tiles that are this yellow, kind of dirt-looking texture are actually able to be hoed. Anything with grass is not plantable. Don't worry though, there's plenty we can do with that space later. You also, and stay with me here, have to water your crops every day. Performing tasks costs energy, which you can see represented in the bar on the bottom right. If you're feeling clever, you can actually track how much each action uses in energy. As you level up and become more proficient with these skills, the amount of energy that each action takes reduces over time. There are also ways to increase your maximum energy, but again, we'll get there. With the crops watered, there isn't a whole heck of a lot else that you can do on day one, so for the rest of the day, I'm just gonna be chopping wood and foraging around the map looking for more sources of energy. One thing that I definitely feel in the early game is that our inventory is way too small. 
That's a big reason why I wanted to do an early push for wood, so that we can set up a few chests around the region. You'll notice that I am not cutting down the stumps on the trees, because it's actually more energy efficient to simply fell the tree and leave the stump. I'll want these cleared out later, but for now I feel it's all about being as effective as possible with our energy. I then deposit anything that I don't need into a chest and go foraging. Alright, so we're like over 10 minutes into this video, and we're still covering day one. So I'll just edit to the end of it. There are 4 seasons and 28 days per season, so let's lock in day one. Overnight is when your skills will level up. We gained enough experience throughout our adventures today that our foraging levels up to two. This gives us a little bit of additional knowledge, some crafting recipes, and later it'll come with some perks that we can choose from. Again, we'll get there. One thing that I love about this game is that it really encourages establishing a few routines. We leave the house and there's a little bit of mail in our box from Willy. He's the resident fisherman inviting us down to the beach so he can teach us what that's all about. First though, we have a couple of chores around the farm. Know that even though I'm not showing it every day, this is pretty much the morning routine from now on. I water my crops, I touch my chickens, and then we start the day. Heading south again and checking my screenshot, it seems that there's a bountiful amount of spring onions available for me in the south. This is why I love the screenshot trick, you can determine if the trip is worth it without wasting any time. Once we're back in town, we can head south to the beach. This triggers a cutscene where we meet Willy. The man, the myth, the legend. He loves fishing, fishing is great, here newcomer, have a rod. Ah, Willy, I can't thank you enough, my man. I will be focusing almost exclusively on fishing for the first part of spring. As luck would have it, just outside of Willy's shack, I notice that there's a cluster of bubbles in the water. These bubbles will appear randomly, indicating higher fish activity. When you land your bobber in the bubbles, the fish will bite four times faster, as well as it increases the effective fishing zone by one. What the heck does that mean? Well, you'll notice that as I'm casting, there's a green bar that fills up. The higher the green bar, the further you will cast. The further out you cast increases the quality of the fish that you may catch. The fishing game itself takes a little bit of getting used to. There's a small green bar that you have to try and keep the fish in. The fish is gonna move around randomly and try to not get caught. If the fish is within your green bar, your progress goes up. If it's outside of the area, it goes down. Pretty straightforward. A trick is not to press and hold the tension button, though. I find that rapidly clicking instead of pressing and holding gives me a lot more control over what the bar does. After catching a whole bunch of fish, giving us a ton of fishing experience right off the bat, the bubbles disappear. Another mechanic to talk about is the fact that there are shops throughout the town. Each shop has a specialization, and Willy's, obviously, is fish. Pretty much every business in town is open from 9am to 5pm, which again works beautifully into my brain. I love trying to make optimal routing. A note though, I am not min-maxing this playthrough, I'm just playing the way I love to play. I take all of my fish from the chest and sell them to Willy. This gives us a nice influx of cash, but I'm not going to be able to do anything with it quite yet. Heading back north through town and making sure to rummage through every garbage can, yes again just assume that I'm doing this every time I pass by. We're heading north to what is my favorite fishing spot. The first order of business is once again putting down that chest so we've got some storage capability up here and ooh, bubbles! The first location that I cast from right next to the fence here is my favorite spot to fish, but you know, bubbles are much better, especially in the early game. We just want to catch as many fish as quickly as possible to level us up. I spend the rest of the day fishing and you can see a couple of random items in here, like some geodes and some iron ore. These are all items from the treasure chest that we've been fishing up throughout the day, and yeah, we have a pretty impressive stack of fish for the first day of fishing. In single player, while you have a fish on the line and are playing the fishing game, time is paused. This again is not the case in multiplayer, allowing you alone to catch significantly more fish in single player. I have even more mechanics to talk about as we also fished up a Joja Cola. Some food and drink items will give you buffs, and in the 1.6 update, Joja Cola now gives you a speed buff. It only lasts like 20 some seconds, but hey, that's enough for us to run home. Real quick before I leave the area though, I just gotta put out Linus's campfire. 
<laughs> oh, never mind. I feel bad. I'll turn it back on. I'm really hoping that you can still see things on YouTube, but back on the farm, I'm heading over to the shipping bin. This bin acts as your primary way of shipping items. Anything that you put into the bin will be shipped overnight for profit. As we saw earlier, we can sell fish to Willy, for instance, but you can't sell everything to every shop. The shipping bin will accept anything that is sellable. Okay, so we're like... 15 minutes into this video, starting day 3. But, I've covered enough mechanics that we can start picking up the pace a little bit. On day 3, it's raining, which is always a beautiful feeling because you don't have to start the day by watering. The first order of business after the chores is heading down to see Willy once again. Because I'm just that awesome, I make it to Willy's shop pretty much at 9 o'clock on the nose. Overnight, we leveled up to 3 in fishing, and level 2 unlocked the fiberglass rod. I reinvest all of the money that we made yesterday into the fiberglass rod, as well as some bait. The original rod could not accept bait, but this one can, increasing the bite rate of fish. Loaded up on bait with a shiny new rod, it's back to the mountain lake. And here we're gonna sit, for pretty much the next 10 days. One final mechanic about fishing is how you gain experience. You gain experience by catching fish, by catching treasure chests, and if you can manage to keep the fish inside of your green bar for the entire time, you will get a perfect modifier, increasing the experience yield and the probability of it being a higher quality fish. Higher quality fish also provide more experience when you catch them. As you level up, your fishing bar within the fishing game becomes larger, and you increase how far you can cast into the water, again increasing the likelihood for higher quality fish and more experience. You do not need to watch me fish eternally, so here are the results from day 3. It's a pretty good haul, and as you can see, our inventory size is terrible. This is why you want to bring chests with you. You'll notice that I'm leaving behind the majority of the highest quality fish. This speaks to my overall strategy at the start of spring, selling only the lesser valuable fish to give us a couple of quality of life items. The more valuable fish though, I am going to be holding on to for a little bit. Overnight, we gain a few more levels in fishing, leveling up to 6. At level 5 and at level 10, you get to choose perks. We'll get into these more later, but my level 5 perk in fishing that I want is the Fisher perk, increasing the value of fish that we sell by 25%. At level 10, we get the perk that increases the fish's value by 50%, so can you guess where this is going? I sold a couple of things overnight, and egg sighting news, our chickens are now producing. I won't be selling too much in this initial stage of the game, hoarding all of the valuable fish until we hit level 10. The next morning, we have a visitor on the farm. This is Marnie, and she runs a shop that deals primarily with animal and animal products. She found this adorable little kitten running around and wants to know if I want it. Heck yeah I do, the default name is Dudley, and even though I try to randomize through a bunch of others, Dudley stole my heart from the first moment. Welcome to the farm. You can choose between a cat and a dog, and it really doesn't make much of a difference, but you can pet them once per day for a little bit of farming experience. Even more fun this morning is that our parsnips are ready to harvest. The act of harvesting them is one of the ways in which you can increase your farming experience. I won't be selling them as they aren't worth much, but this does increase our farming level. Even though we are super focused on fishing right now, it is important to continue developing our other skills. Day 5 is super exciting, with tons of unlocks that happen. On the way into town, we trigger a cutscene with Lewis explaining what the community center is. It's an old run-down building, and we have two options. We can restore it by supplying specific items to the bundles inside, or we could just go to Joja Corp and pay money. If you choose the Joja Corp path, this building turns into a warehouse, and that's just a little bit soul-crushing for me. Inside, we get our first encounter with the Junomos. Strange, little, adorable, forest, magic creature things. When you interact with the tablet that appears, you'll notice that it's in total gibberish, but don't worry, this triggered something. On the way back home, I stopped at Pierre's shop to buy a couple of seeds to fill out our farm. The community center bundles will require a variety of forage, crops, animal products, you name it. The seeds I selected are tuned towards filling out those bundles. We'll be making our money somewhere else. Not fish money, though. The fish money is going to serve to propel our farming endeavors. Another, another mechanic to cover right now is that just south of the farm, on Friday and Sunday, if you travel a little bit to the west, there's a traveling merchant. Their stock and prices are randomized, but there's some pretty nifty items you can collect if you keep an eye on them. And we're fishing. A 
third thing happened on day five, and that is that the boulder that was previously blocking us from the mines is now gone. The mines, you say? Yeah, I want to be rich first. On the morning of day six, it's raining again, so hooray, less chores! We received a note from the wizard to come and visit him in his tower. Hugging the west side of the map where the traveling merchant was a second ago, we can head south and there it is. Because we lacked the knowledge to understand what that tablet in the community center was trying to tell us, he's gonna give us a little help by feeding us a strange tonic that makes us absolutely trip for a second. But now we've gained secret knowledge. We now understand what the Junimos are asking of us, and if we go into our inventory, we can open up the tab that shows us some of these community center bundles. In the Spring Forage bundle, you can see the four items required, and that I already have three of them in my inventory. This is just forage that I've been collecting throughout the last couple of days, and because of the screenshot trick, I knew that there was a dandelion down here. It just wasn't worth coming over here for one dandelion until this point. We can then take those items to the community center and turn them into the tablet. Completing a bundle provides you with a reward and, in the early stages, unlocks even more bundles for you to fill out. The first tablet deals primarily with foraging, and then the second one unlocked deals with farming, with the third over by the fish tank being, yep, fish. Filling out every single bundle and completing the community center is one task among many that we have on our path to perfection. Oh, and I forgot to mention, on day 5, after accumulating just over 2,000 gold, that quality of life item that I was talking about is the backpack in Pierre's general store. This unlocks the second of three lines in our inventory, and gosh, is that gonna be nice. The next several days are pretty much just me doing the chores, a little bit of foraging, and fishing. On day 10, I can point out another lovely little introduction in the 1.6 update. On day 10, we're just fishing away, having a good time, when a little pop-up tells us something. Well, two pop-ups. We've used our last piece of bait, but we've also got some new ideas to sleep on. I was a little lost on what this meant initially, but what I've determined is that this is actually showing you when you level up your skill. We were level 9, which means that we are now level 10, and at 7pm on day 10, I am done fishing. Overnight, I level up to 10, choosing the Angler perk, making our fish worth 50% more. I'm not gonna sell the fish quite yet, but it will be very soon. Instead, today, it's time to go visit the mines. First, I'm making sure to grab that chest that we were using to fish with. We don't need it there anymore, so let's bring it to the mines with us. I do a quick little arc over the top of the lake, collecting all the forage, and then it's into the mines. We're greeted by Marlin, the leader of the Adventurer's Guild. The mines will serve two facets of gaining experience, mining and combat. Marlin gives us a sword and a task to defeat ten green jellies. You know you're playing an RPG when... He does give us a sword, but honestly, it is total garbage, and that little trident in my inventory was a dagger that I picked up from one of the treasure boxes while fishing. It'll be doing significantly more damage. I set up my chest and dive into the mines. The way the mines work is that every floor is randomly generated. The staircase to the next level has an increasingly high probability of popping up as you break rocks on the floor. The staircase will appear from breaking a rock, or geode, or defeating an enemy. I'm again being incredibly intentional in how I attack the mines. Every five levels that you progress downwards unlocks an elevator, which is essentially a checkpoint. I can then ride the elevator back up to the top, depositing anything from my inventory that I don't want, riding the elevator back down to floor 5, right where we left off. On floor 6, I think that this gives a great feel as to how I'm approaching the mines. You can see that as I'm cruising through, I'm targeting only the grey rocks, ore, and monsters. That's because they're the only things in here that are giving me experience, and I do want to try to stay as optimal as possible. There is a daily luck modifier that impacts a lot of different things in this game, but again, we'll be touching on that more later. Also, yes, we do have proper game audio now, some egghead didn't record it for the first few days. Back at home overnight, our farming levels up because I've been doing just a couple of odds and ends, but our mining is the one that we're focused on now. Because we've been exposed to the underground of Stardew Valley, Clint shows up giving us a few tips. Clint is the town blacksmith in charge of, you guessed it, ores, mining, smelting, all that kind of stuff. He teaches us how to make a furnace, kicking off our mining career. Taking a second to appreciate the rainy day, we're back at the mines where I'm going to be building a couple of those furnaces. This is a super nifty trick, I feel, and I did not play like this for a very long time. Keeping a chest and a couple of furnaces at the top of the elevator allows us to constantly be refilling our furnaces, cooking the ores into bars. 
I always used to keep everything centralized at the farm, and why? The only consideration to leaving things in the overworld is that they do not interrupt an NPC's path. They will walk around the world, and instead of going around things, if you place things in their path, they will get frustrated and just go through it. This breaks the item, and in the case of chests, everything that's inside. Just a little cautionary tip early on, but I feel like we've covered so many mechanics so early, let's just kick back and enjoy spring for a little bit. Okay, I can't help myself. One final trick. I'll discuss this and the mechanics surrounding it a bit more in the future, but there is a hard cutoff at night where your character will simply pass out. When you pass out, the game enters its overnight sequence, leveling you up and saving the progress. The problem with passing out is that you will lose up to 10% of your money, which is why we haven't sold the fish yet, as well as if you level up in that same night that you passed out, you will not have the energy penalty the following morning. Just a little something extra for you to think about. After getting our level 10 fishing perk a couple of days ago this morning, I made sure to toss all of those fish in the bin. On the night of day 12, we make 46,684 gold. That feels good, and we're about to spend pretty much all of it. The reason I chose to sell all of my fish on the 12th is because on the 13th, we encounter our first event. I'll be discussing event mechanics a little bit more later, but for now, all you have to know is that these are special days in which all of the shops are closed and something fun is happening somewhere on the map. In the shop of this spring egg event are some seeds that are not available otherwise. The amount that I'm buying wasn't really planned ahead of time, I'm just kind of going off of past experience, but I buy 100 strawberry seeds. If you haven't met everybody in town yet, during a festival is the time to do it because pretty much everybody shows up every time. That's all I want to cover with the festivals right now, they do repeat every single year, so if you miss one, it's okay. The next morning, it's time to start expanding our farm empire. I'm gonna be laying out all 100 of our strawberry seeds, plus a little bit of extra space for some community center goals. I chose to do this project today, but we did have a little bit of leeway with our strawberries. The plant itself is gonna take eight days to grow, giving us our first harvest, but then every four days after that, it will produce another harvest. That in comparison to something like the parsnips that we saw earlier, where we simply planted them and harvested them once they were grown. Strawberries are the gift that just keeps on giving. Once we have our field established, it's time to head off to town and really start spending some money. My first stop is the general store, where I'm gonna once again be upgrading our backpack. This might not have been super optimal this early, but my goodness, having the biggest bag is so nice. I then stop at the pub in the center of town, which we haven't seen yet. After waiting for what feels like a short eternity for Gus to get to the counter, we're able to buy a few items from him. He provides a couple of food and drink items, and I am interested primarily in salad and coffee. Salad is going to provide us with some great energy recovery, and the coffees are going to make us move faster. Just like the Joja Cola, they give us a plus one speed buff, but this one lasts quite a bit longer. Moving faster around the map helps us forage, mine, pretty much everything. I'm not going to be spending all of my money here, keeping some in reserve for the traveling merchant in case they have something nice for me, and we do have some tool upgrades we want to do soon. After making sure everything else is good, I head up to the mines to do just a little bit before the end of the day. I have managed to get all the way down to floor 40, and you'll notice a slight change in how the mines look. This first mine has 120 floors, with kind of three main zones. 0 to 40, you're going to be finding primarily copper, 40 to 80 will be iron, and then 80 to 120 will be gold. You may note though that as you get lower in the mines, the rocks become increasingly difficult to break. This is helped by upgrading your pickaxe, but I want to upgrade my watering can first. I'll revisit the TV and the mechanics around it in a little bit, but you are able to check the weather report every morning. This tells you what the weather is going to be on the next day. Tools take two days to upgrade, and since I don't want to lose out on a day of watering, I waited until I saw rain in the forecast. That morning, I very laboriously watered all hundred and some of our plants, but that's about to get easier. Your watering can, for some reason, has a finite amount of water it can hold. I'm not saying I'm annoyed by the trip to the river, but it's going to be nice to do that less. You may not have noticed it yet, but I do have this one little chest kind of tucked off in the corner on the way out of the farm. I make sure to keep everything that I want to donate to the community center or to the museum in this chest. Oh yeah, we're not even close to uncovering all of the things we can do yet. I've also got all of my geodes stashed in here because we're heading to Clint this morning. 
I'll speak more to this process later, but I'm able to bring all of my geodes to Clint for processing. There's some goodies inside of those that I'll donate to the museum, but again, we'll get back to that. What we're really here for is upgrading our watering can to the next tier. For the low, low cost of 5 copper bars and 2,000 gold, Clint will take two days to upgrade our watering can. On day 16, I make it down to floor 80 in the mines. This is when gold is going to start showing up, but I don't need that for a while, so it's time to actually start farming some of these ores. Because of the elevator, you can jump down to a floor and see if it's worth your time or not. For iron, I enjoy going to floor 40 over and over and over, and if that seems to dry up, then I go to floor 60. If there's not really anything on the floor that looks enticing, I just ride the elevator up and reset the floor. This serves two purposes again, not only getting us ore, which we're gonna need because with that many plants to water, I want sprinklers. But targeting the ores primarily is also giving us the most experience we can be getting, probably. On the night of day 17, we've leveled up our mining to five, once again facing a perk choice. In the early game, I find the minor perk to be more useful, getting plus one ore per vein as opposed to a chance for double gems. Double gems is going to be nice later in the game when we want to be focused a bit more on money and specialty items, but right now, all I want is as much ore as possible. I want sprinklers, I want better tools, I want all the things. On the morning of day 18, I have to do a little bit of chores waiting for Clint to open up. Once we talk to him, he gives us our shiny new watering can, and I came prepared. I brought materials and money for him to upgrade our pickaxe next. Back on the farm with our copper watering can, now if we press and hold the button to use our watering can, our range will extend. We're now able to water three spots for the cost of a single action, and yes, that does apply to the amount of water within the can as well. This does not mean that you get more water actions out of the watering can per fill, but you are able to water more spaces per fill. I hope that makes sense. This dramatically cuts down the amount of time we have to spend watering every day. And the next goal is to reduce that even further, aiming to get some sprinkler set up. We have to be a little bit patient though, we don't know how to create sprinklers yet. We'll figure out how those are made after we level up our farming skill. According to my research, our first strawberry harvest should be the 22nd. Thanks, Dorothy Ann. Also, you'll notice a scarecrow standing in the middle of the field. Oh my goodness, so many mechanics to discuss. We'll get back to it. Speaking of the endless depth of this game, we are now also in salmonberry season. In spring, on days 15 through 18, you'll notice that a bunch of the bushes around the map have these little red berries on them. On my way to Clint's or the mines over the last several days, I have been making sure to go out of my way to pick them up. The salads are a great way to supplement our energy, but it is not a long-term solution. We are not that rich yet. Salmon berries may only be 25 energy a pop, for now, but that is free energy. I've got like 30 of these things right now, that's a lot of mining. I was a little discombobulated here, forgetting that I intended to bring a bunch of community center items with me, so I pop back to the farm real quick and let's head there. I submit a few of the items, collecting no prizes, but clearing up our inventory a little bit back home. Because day 18 is the last day of salmonberry season, I do one final sweep of the map, being a little bit more thorough than usual, collecting over 70, and I have already been eating these. On day 19, our pickaxe is still being upgraded, but fortune shines on us again. Well, I guess it doesn't, because it's raining, but that is good news. We've covered a lot of fishing mechanics already, but there are different fish that you can get in different zones. Because it's springtime and it's raining, there is a fish that I want to catch in the Villages River before moving back to the Mountain Lake. These are the only circumstances in which catfish show up, which we do need for the community center. Again, you don't have to worry about this right now if you don't want to. This is just how I'm playing the game. There is effectively endless time in this game. You can always come back and get it later. I catch my catfish and head off to the mountain lake where once again I'm looking for a very specific kind of fish. Once you've reached level 10 in fishing in the mountain lake during spring, when it's raining, you have a chance of finding the legend fish. There are five fish that are kind of, I guess, boss fish that require specific conditions to be met and are very difficult to catch. If I can land this fish and somehow catch it in the iridium quality, that's like 
15,000 gold with the angler perk. Alas, despite the amount of times that it ends up on my hook throughout the day, we are not going to be catching it. I am not using the best fishing rod right now, and it's simply because I have other things I want to spend my money on. Like I said, we can always come back later. Despite not getting that legend fish, we do make a respectable 4,500 gold, which is more than I need right now. Well, that's kind of a lie. I always need more, but it's fine for now. For the first time in this run, this really feels like a couple of day period where I can just relax and catch up on a couple of things. Our copper pickaxe's upgrade has finished this morning, but I'm actually going to be turning the pickaxe immediately back into clint, upgrading it to steel next. Of course I'll be processing geodes and all of that, but we'll be covering that more in the summer season. The plan for the rest of the day is simply to forage and chop trees, which does give forage experience. Since I'm kind of forced out of the mines right now while upgrading my pickaxe, I want to try and set myself up as much as I can. I'm planning to build and upgrade some buildings soon, and we need a lot of raw materials for that. We received a quest in the mail from Robin that she lost her axe. It's sitting down in the Spring Onion area, but something else exciting happens down here. Another new mechanic introduced in 1.6 are these books. I just picked up Woody's Secret while chopping a tree, and after reading it, it gives trees a chance to drop double the wood. Oh my, I wonder what other books are available. I'm sure we're gonna find out. The next day, the strategy remains pretty much the same, still waiting on our pickaxe to upgrade. This time I'm swinging up to Robins to turn in that axe to her, but I'm also gonna have her build a silo. Building a silo has been a quest on the Meadowlands farm since the beginning. It's gonna give us a place to store hay for our animals. This is important to have because I intend to do a little bit of cleanup around the farm soon. As we cut grass with the scythe, our silo, once it's built, will be collecting the hay. Without the silo, the grass doesn't really give you anything, so why waste the resource? Then, after a little bit of forage, I'm back on the farm clearing out some area, mostly targeting the trees. At the end of day 21, we level up to 4 in farming, but 5 in foraging, giving us another perk option. At the start of this run, I was tempted towards the Forester perk for the additional wood drops, but with the addition of those books to the game, I'm actually leaning towards Gatherer. Gatherer, in my opinion, is the much superior perk, but in the early section of the game when you really need resources, I felt that wood might be better. That was until I got a book that gave me a chance to double my wood drops. We are fine. Let's go, Gatherer. Exciting news on the morning of day 22, both our strawberries and parsnips are ready to harvest. Similar to how I handled the fish, I will not be selling these strawberries right away. This amount of harvesting is absolutely going to level up our farming, and we have another perk that I'm interested in at level 5. After the harvest, we're over at Clint's picking up our fancy new steel pickaxe, and it's off to the mines from there. First though, I popped into the general store, and we get a little cutscene introducing this Morris character. Morris is the face of Joja Corp in this game. So this guy, he just waltzes right into somebody else's store, offers a 50% off coupon, and takes all the customers away. Please explain to me why you would ever want to support this man. I'm not going to spend too much time dwelling on my dislike of Morris, but there's a cutscene later in the run after completing the community center that I am very much looking forward to. Going from the base level pickaxe to steel makes a massive difference in the mine. Gold ore now takes three hits with the pickaxe instead of five. With the farming egg experience that we're earning tonight, we should level up enough to learn how to make quality sprinklers, so we're definitely going to want to start smelting up some gold. Also, when we defeat this little dude over here, he's going to drop us a Void Essence. This is going to help us off in the community center in the boiler room. Those objectives I want to get done as soon as possible. I then mined for a little while, coming back to the community center to turn some stuff in. I mentioned the rewards that you get for completing each individual bundle. There are secondary rewards though if you complete all bundles within a single room. The boiler room here is focused primarily on mining objectives, and upon completing all of those objectives, we will unlock the mine carts. Unlocking those is going to allow us to travel around the map much more effectively. Oh, it seems I forgot my earth crystal and frozen tier. One second, I'm just going to run back home. If there's one thing this game teaches you, it's to be prepared. We're losing like two hours in this day just running back for no reason. And there we have it. Bundle complete and boiler room complete. 
We trigger a little cutscene, and I think I got a little hasty and ended up clicking past it, so I do apologize for that. Let me just take this opportunity to say that if you want to see the cutscene, I encourage you to play this game yourself. It's fantastic. Not only is the boiler room all fixed up, but the Junimos will eventually, ooh, some visual things are going weird here, add a star to the big board in the middle. Another update in 1.6 is that you can now also check your progress on the community center in a bit more detail in your character menu. Looking good, and then overnight we get a cutscene of the Junimos repairing those minecarts. Initially, there are three locations that you can fast travel between. The bus stop, right next to Clint's shop, and the mines. We also level up to five in farming, choosing another perk. I held on to our harvest because the tiller perk makes our crops worth 10% more. We level up to six, unlocking the ability to craft quality sprinklers. All of that work that we put in in the early sections of spring are really starting to show. The plan pretty much for the rest of the season is just gather as many resources as possible and set myself up for summer. This is already made easier as we simply head to the bus stop in the morning now, clicking on the minecart. I then fast travel to the mines and hey presto. More things that make our lives that little bit easier. From there though, the plan for the entirety of day 23 is mine. Overnight, we level up to six in mining because with our new pickaxe, I have been tearing through ores. Tearing through ores, though, reveals another problem that we haven't had yet. I am so completely out of coal right now. Since we also have our farming perk now, I also made sure to sell a little bit of the harvest. I only sold the silver and gold quality strawberries here. I kind of like having a bunch of assets spread around instead of it all just being gold. At the end of day 24, I have gathered enough materials to fully cover our field in sprinklers. This actually gets incredibly close though. The sprinklers only operate overnight, so if you place them in the morning, those crops surrounding them will not be watered. I get hung up on one of my own sprinklers at the last moment and just barely pop down the final sprinkler as the time rolls over to 2am and we pass out. Ironically enough, the next day it's raining, so getting that sprinkler down didn't matter. Oh well, it's done, and since it's raining today, I want to do some fishing. After fishing this heavily this early, is there any way that I'm not getting the legend fish this season? This might be our last chance to do it, so I'm going all in, buying the iridium rod, several trap bobbers, and some trout soup. I then do a touch of fishing in the village river, waiting for noon o'clock. Well, noon plus 20 minutes because it takes Gus so long to walk to his counter. I've had a headache for like four days because I ran out of coffee. Then, fully supplied up, we're back at the mountain lake fishing. After a few casts, we get the legend on the line. Let's go. It's a hard fought battle, but honestly, not that bad now that we have the trap bobber. We'll keep covering fishing mechanics later. I just wanted to be excited about this for a second. On the walk home, I'm all like, I've got my legend, I've got my legend, carrying it above my head and right into the shipping container. The legend fish is the only of the five unique boss style fishes that respawns year by year. That's the only reason why I'm fine with selling this thing. And I'd say that that was worth it. Just under 17,500 gold for the day, 11,250 of which was one fish. This has been an awesome spring. Then it's back to that resource grind, coming back to our coal problem. Around floor 40 has a chance of spawning these little dust sprites. I find that they're the best way to get coal in the early game, and they have a secondary effect. Yeah, there's even more objectives that we haven't discussed, like the monster hunting objectives. Again, we're gonna get back to those, but killing a specific number of different monsters around the world provides rewards. I want the reward from the dust sprite kills. But really, this is all I'm doing until the end of the season. Earlier in the spring, Demetrius approached us if we wanted a bat cave or a mushroom cave. I, of course, went with the mat cave. Na 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 na. Not only because me, but because the bat cave offers some unique forage. I'm able to collect an orange and a cherry, which would typically take quite a while to acquire. They're from seasonal fruit trees, so I'm really lucky to have gotten these so early. They're gonna help us fill out the bundles in the community center that get us our greenhouse. Day 27, it's raining once again, and I was feeling like I wanted a little bit more money for summer. 
Because it's raining and we've already caught the legend fish this season, I'm actually down in the forest river fishing. Now that we've got some fishing skills, the catfish are much easier to catch, and they are by far the most valuable things to come out of the water. Well, you know, normal fish to come out of the water. At the end of the day, our fishing expedition nets us just over 10k. Not bad at all. And here we are at last, day 28, the final day of spring. And I'll be spending it entirely in the mines farming coal. I managed to pick up a farm warp totem, which teleports you immediately back to the farm. I was trying so hard to get the last batch of gold in, thinking that the warp totem would save me. We're cutting this super thin, but I use the warp totem, and I'm stuck behind a tree. I have no axe right now. Once our copper axe was ready to go, I just resubmitted it straight to Clint to upgrade to steel. Um, I guess let's just get comfortable until we pass out. And there we go. I'll play a little bit of footage of me mining on day 28 while we do a quick recap of what spring year one looked like. Our total earnings so far are 126,777 gold, currently holding about 40,000 of it in our hands. Our skills are level 7 in farming, 8 in mining, 5 in foraging, 10 in fishing, and 5 in combat. We've also completed any spring components of the community center and unlocked the minecarts. I have a field that's fully covered in sprinklers, a steel pickaxe, a copper watering can, about to have a steel axe. Things are feeling pretty darn good in the valley right now. Looking at our progress on the farm from day 1 to 28, we got some stuff done, but a lot more of the visual changes are coming. And that covers Spring of Year One. This video ended up being way longer than I thought it would be because, wow, I have a lot to talk about in Stardew. It feels like every facet of this game is some new rabbit hole for me to dive down and explain. Over the course of this series, I'm definitely going to need a few hours to cover all the things I want to say, let alone the gameplay. I want to extend a special thank you to those of you generous enough to support the channel through YouTube memberships, Patreon, and Super Chat. Your support makes these videos possible so I can continue to put all of my effort into producing this content for everyone out there to enjoy. From the bottom of my shell, thank you so much. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. Watching until the end of the video, your engagement and subscriptions all help my channel so much. If you feel like I've earned it, consider leaving a like and comment about spring, what you would have done differently, or just to say hi. Hey there! If you'd like to keep up with my future releases, be sure to subscribe and enable notifications to never miss a video. I personally loved making this video for all of you and cannot wait to show you summer next week. Until next time, take care everyone.